Very good. Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs, a co-production of the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For more than a decade now, our seminar series has tried to provide a nonpartisan forum in the nation's capital to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications that shed new light on policy relevant issues in national and global affairs. We're delighted that the Wilson Center's Rule of Law Initiative is co-sponsoring this session as well. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book by American University professor Amanda Frost, You Are Not American, Citizens Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Dr. Frost, congratulations on the publication and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're also very fortunate to have with us Professor Gary Gersel, who will provide initial comments and begin this afternoon's discussion that we hope will involve many of you in the audience as well. I want to welcome to you, Dr. Gersel, as well. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the, His the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair the seminar with Eric Arneson of George Washington University. Eric serves as director of the National History Center. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. Behind the scenes, two individuals helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We want to acknowledge our supporters and we thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University uh, History Department. We welcome your support. Donations to our two organizations are tax deductible. Uh, details on how to support the seminar will now be available in the chat uh, or simply go to our, our institutional websites. A quick explanation uh, on the format of the discussion. Our session today will be fully recorded and will soon appear on our respective organization's websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, there are three options. Uh, we like you to use the raised hand function in the Zoom functionality if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue. You can do this right now or anytime during the presentations. When the moderator calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to mute your screen. Please press yes, and you will uh, otherwise you will not be able to talk. You can start getting in line, as I said, uh, now. You could also use the Q&A uh, function up in the Zoom functionality to post um, uh, a question, or you can submit your question to Rachel Wheatley via email at rwheatley at historians.org. And with that, I'll turn the Zoom room over to my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Eric. Thank you, Christian, uh, and welcome to Amanda Frost and Gary Gerstel for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I have the uh, honor of introducing uh, our uh, uh, two participants, and I'll start with uh, Amanda Frost, who will be speaking on her uh, book first. She is the Bronfman Distinguished Professor of Law and Government at American University here in Washington, D.C., where she writes and teaches in the fields of constitutional, immigration, and citizenship law. In 2015, she won the American University Washington College of Law's Excellence in Teaching Award. Her recent publications include The Supreme Court Has to Choose Between Trump and the Nation's Founders for the New Republic in November of 2020, The Fragility of American Citizenship for the Atlantic in 2019, and The New War on Naturalized Citizens for the American Prospect also in 2019. She's a regular columnist for the SCOTUS blog, a leading blog covering the US Supreme Court. And before entering academia, she clerked on the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit and spent five years as a staff attorney at Public Citizen, where she litigated cases at all levels of the federal judiciary. She has also worked for the Senate Judiciary Committee, serving as acting director of the Immigrant Justice Clinic, uh, and spent a year as a Fulbright Scholar studying transparency reform in the European Union. And today, she will be speaking on her new book, You Are Not a Citizen, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers, published several months ago by Beacon Press. Uh, and with that, Professor Frost, the Zoom room, it's all yours. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for that kind introduction and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm gonna start my talk as I start the book with the story of Ethel McKenzie. Ethel McKenzie was born in 1895 in San Francisco. She was the daughter of a wealthy vintner and was something of a socialite. But in her twenties, she caught what she called suffrage fever. And she began to lead the movement or was one of the leaders of the movement for women's suffrage in California. And in fact, the women of California won the right to vote in 1911, nine years before the 19th Amendment was added to the US Constitution. But when Ethel McKenzie went to cast her vote, um, she was told by the San Francisco registrar that she could not vote. And not only could she not vote, but she was not a citizen of the United States. And the reason was because she had married a non-citizen. And under a 1907 federal law, she had automatically lost her citizenship as had tens of thousands of other US citizen women who married non-citizens. So being a red-blooded American, she decided to file a lawsuit and she took her case all the way up to the US Supreme Court. So my book is a story, is the stories of people like Ethel McKenzie, individuals uh, who represent groups who were stripped of their citizenship, amounting to millions of people over the course of US history. Um, there's two themes that I follow throughout the book. Um, one is that I argue that the US government used citizenship stripping to deprive disfavored individuals and groups of political and civil rights, such as the right to vote and the right to remain in the United States. And in fact, that citizenship stripping became a proxy for taking away rights that they could no longer deprive people of on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, political opinion, or immigration status of parents. But citizenship stripping served as a proxy for doing just that. And a second theme I follow throughout the book is that citizenship stripping is about more than just the legal rights of citizens. It's also symbolic and it's also about identity formation. So to take away someone's citizenship is in part to deny them an identity that is uh, key to who they were, American citizens. And it also defines the rest of us, those who remain behind, and it helps to define what being an American means, or at least that's what the government hoped to do by taking away citizenship. Um, I also want to make one methodological point about the book. I'm a law professor, and it is a legal history, and I certainly do talk about Supreme Court cases. But my goal in writing this book was to tell the stories of individuals who'd lost their citizenship and to frame it as much as possible through their words and their eyes. So I did a deep dive into the archive and as often as possible quoted from their letters, their testimony, their diary entries and interviews with them uh, to tell the story as much as possible from their perspective. Um, and so before I launch into the historical sweep of this book and some of the stories in it, I also wanna just give a quick citizenship 101. Um, so what does it mean to be a US citizen? Well, the Black's Law Dictionary defines a citizen as someone who's a member of the community enjoying, enjoying the full rights and privileges of membership in that community. In the United States today, that means a citizen, an adult citizen has the right to vote with the exception of a few states that exclude uh, convicted felons. A citizen has uh, the right and obligation to serve on a jury. Only citizens can be elected to federal government and most state government positions. And there are some jobs and professions in state uh, and federal government that are limited only to citizens. And most important of all today and in our past as well is that citizens have the right to enter the United States and remain. And that's never remained so, been so important as today with um, various limits on entry in part due to COVID. Um, so that's the meaning of citizenship legally. Although, as I said, my book is about more than just that. It's also about the symbolic understanding and the identity formation that comes with calling oneself a US citizen. So as the subtitle of my book suggests, I start the story with Dred Scott. So Dred and Harriet Scott were slaves living in St. Louis, Missouri um, in the 1850s. And they filed a suit seeking freedom because they'd been brought into a free state by their owner. But a threshold question in the case was whether or not they had the right to file suit because the court lacked jurisdiction unless they were US citizens. Now, this was a really interesting and important and debated question in the 1850s. So blacks had in fact voted to ratify the constitution. So it'd be bizarre to think that they had voted to ratify a document that deprived them of citizenship. But the US constitution did not define who was a citizen. So it wasn't perfectly clear whether free blacks were indeed citizens in a nation with 4 million enslaved black people and half a million free black people. 
although some states did treat them as citizens and give them the right to vote. Still, it was a contested question. So when Tread and Harriet Scott filed their suit, that was one of the questions before the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Taney uh, answered that question in the negative. He said, Blacks, and I'm quoting from him here, Blacks are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution of the United States and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. So in one sweeping declaration, he took away the citizenship of half a million free Blacks who had thought of themselves as citizens of the United States. So Dred Scott really laid the groundwork for what was to come because that took us to the Civil War, of course, it precipitated in part the Civil War. And in 1865, at the end of that war, we have what I refer to as a race for citizenship because we have two groups of people in the United States who are not citizens. One group is the newly freed slaves. So 4.5 million blacks living in the United States who form the majority in some Southern states, but under the Dred Scott decision, they were not citizens. Another group who were not citizens were the white Confederate leaders, men like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. They were not citizens because they had expatriated themselves. They had declared themselves to be a new country with a new flag, a new anthem, a new constitution, their own army, their own stamps, their own currency. And in fact, Charles Sumner had said on the floor of the Senate that their enemy aliens in the Supreme Court had similarly referred to them as no longer being Americans. So the question was what was gonna happen in 1865 to these two groups of people. And the Reconstruction Congress knew that this was an extremely important question because of the three-fifths compromise, which uh, people listening may remember was the odious provision of the constitution that said we count all uh, people in each state for the purpose of allocating representation in the House of Representatives in Congress. But each slave is not counted as a person, they're counted as three-fifths of a person. So this provision had given the Southern states 18 to 20 slave seats in the pre-Civil War era, seats that the South controlled based on their slave population, but which of course the slaves had no power to control themselves. But it was the great irony of the Civil War that after the slaves were freed in the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, um, suddenly these people would be counted as a full person. And so the South would have even more representation in Congress once they re-entered the Union and yet if the leaders of the Confederacy had their way, of course, these newly freed slaves would have no political power. So the Reconstruction Congress decided, okay, we have to ensure that the newly freed slaves gain their citizenship before the leaders of the, of the Confederacy do. And they solved that problem through the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, which granted birthright citizenship to everyone born on US soil. So that provision, a race Dred Scott gave citizenship to all the newly freed slaves. And as I discuss in my book, uh, citizenship to anyone born on US soil, regardless of who their parents were. That 14th Amendment provision, uh, 14th Amendment also in section three, took away significant citizenship rights from the former leaders of the Confederacy. Section three provided that if any person had uh, aided in the insurrection uh, and had previously served in high office, that person was barred from being a member of either a state or federal government. So that meant men like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, leaders of the Confederacy, could never hold elected office. And this became very symbolic when in 1870, a man named Hiram Rhodes Revels was elected to be Senator from Mississippi. He was an African-American man, he'd actually never been enslaved. And he was elected to serve a Senator and he became the first African-American in Congress. And in a, great, in a great moment of symbolism, he took over the seat that had formerly been held by Jefferson Davis at a moment when Jefferson Davis was barred from ever serving in government. But interestingly, at first he wasn't allowed to be seated because a few senators argued that he was not a citizen, regardless of what the 14th Amendment said. They said nothing can overrule Dred Scott. The 14th Amendment is a dead letter and he cannot serve, he's no citizen and he's not eligible to serve as a member of this body. Um, they lost that argument and Hiram Rhodes Revels served in office. But as I explain in the book, the uh, gains of reconstruction where the newly freed slaves uh, exercised significant political power, voting in significant numbers, sending significant numbers uh, of people into the, both the Congress and also the state governments 
That was short-lived. After the federal government abandoned Reconstruction, a combination of Jim Crow laws and violence uh, resulted in a disenfranchisement of the Black population and the uh, end of Blacks being elected to high office until, frankly, well after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So Blacks retained citizenship in name only for a good period of time following Reconstruction. But during that Reconstruction era, they had briefly gained citizenship. Well, what of the former leaders of the Confederacy? Um, of course, I think as many know, they, uh, uh, after a period of a couple dozen years, became celebrated, their monuments dot, the nation are slowly being taken down. And most telling to me, most symbolic, was that in 1975, the House of Representatives voted nearly unanimously to give Robert E. Lee his citizenship back. Obviously, purely symbolic, it was posthumous, and Robert E. Lee would not be holding office. But it was an extraordinary move, and in 1978, Congress did it again, voting to give Jefferson Davis his citizenship back. And when President Gerald Ford signed it into law, sitting on the steps of Robert E. Lee's family home in Arlington National Cemetery, he said, General Lee's character has been an example to succeeding generations, making the restoration of a citizenship an event in which every American can take pride. And I find reading that uh, statement from 1975 pretty, pretty shocking today and pretty telling about the state of citizenship of those two groups. Um, so of course, the citizenship battles and citizenship stripping did not end there, and I trace it through history. Um, another very interesting and important moment in citizenship stripping came with Chinese Americans. So Chinese immigrated to the United States and were actually much wanted in a, in a nation that needed labor in the 1850s and 60s. But following an economic downturn, anti-Chinese animus grew. There was actually a number of um, pogroms and lynchings in California. Um, and then the Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted in 1882 to bar almost all future Chinese immigrants. And it was the first significant anti-immigration law barring a significant group of people from coming to the United States. So in this chapter of the book, I follow a man named Wong Kim Ark. Born in San Francisco, in Chinatown in San Francisco, to two uh, immigrant, Chinese immigrant parents. He lived in the United States his whole life, but he traveled back and forth to China to see family occasionally by steamship. And when he came back into the United States in the mid 1890s, the US government said, no, you can't uh, land on the US soil. In fact, they kept him on a steamship in San Francisco Bay. And they said, we agree you were born in the United States but we don't believe you're a US citizen. We don't think the 14th Amendment citizenship clause applies to you. Um, the government argued that his parents were immigrants and therefore they owed allegiance to the emperor of China and so did he. And that meant he wasn't subject to the jurisdiction of the United States as required by the 14th Amendment. So the US government took this argument all the way up to the Supreme Court and a man named Holmes Conrad was Solicitor General and I found this utterly remarkable. He argues before the Supreme Court, first, that the text of the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to Wong Kim Ark and to all children of non-citizens. Remarkable um, argument, since it would have immediately taken away citizenship from hundreds of thousands, people that would no longer be able to vote or hold office. Um, and he also argued that the 14th Amendment itself was unconstitutional which is just extraordinary to see the Solicitor General argue that a provision of the Constitution is unconstitutional. And Holmes Conrad was a former uh, Confederate Army officer, and I think he was trying to win the Civil War 30 years later. This was in 1898. So this was a hard fought case, a closed case, but the Supreme Court ruled in Wong Kim Ark's favor, establishing birthright citizenship definitively for all, all people born in the United States, regardless of the immigration status of their parents, or at least it supposedly did, because I de delved into the archive and kept following Wong Kim Ark's story. And I discovered um, through uh, documents that had previously not been available, that Wong Kim Ark had been arrested and detained three years after he won his Supreme Court case by immigration officials who didn't believe he was a US citizen. And he had to post bail and was kept in detention and hire a lawyer, and eventually he convinced them, no, I'm the guy who won the Supreme Court case establishing birthright citizenship for the nation. And of his four children, one was barred from entering the United States on the ground that he was not a citizen. So those citizenship battles continued in different form. Even though the Supreme Court declared birthright citizenship the law of the land, the US government took the position that you had to prove it. 
and it was going to make it difficult for certain groups to establish their citizenship to the satisfaction of the government. So from there, the book talks about women like Ethel McKenzie who lost their citizenship. Although that story has at, at first, it went badly for Ethel McKenzie at first, but in the end, there was, there was a happy ending. Ethel McKenzie lost her Supreme Court case, challenging her loss of citizenship on behalf of all women in her position. The Supreme Court ruled 9-0 against her, said, if you wanted to marry a non-citizen, you deserve to lose your citizenship. But then women got elected to Congress following the 19th Amendment. One of those women had also lost her citizenship by marrying a non-citizen and then got it back only because her husband died. She's elected to office, and it serves in the House of Representatives and helps to change the law, abolishing citizenship stripping of women who marry non-citizens. So in the end, a happy story, although not uh, because of the Supreme Court in that case. Um, moving on to World War II, I discuss how I think most of us, I hope, know about the concentration camps where Japanese and Japanese Americans were kept by the US government during World War II. But I hadn't been familiar with the fact that the US government coerced about 6,000 of those Japanese Americans into renouncing their citizenship. And immediately after the war, they tried to get it back and a 15 year legal battle ensued. And eventually almost all of those 6,000 Japanese Americans were granted their citizenship back and the US government apologized. So that was another, I think, pretty telling example of both the, the legal importance of citizenship, but also its symbolic importance. Um, so I follow the book on through the 20th century. I talk about citizenship stripping as used to target political enemies of the government. Women, uh, people such as Emma Goldman, the infamous anarchist, Harry Bridges, a very effective labor leader who went through four trials to defend his citizenship. Um, and I also talk about the mass repatriation, which I'll put in quotes, of Mexican and Mexican Americans in both the 1930s and the 1950s, which was clearly designed to deprive the people born in the United States of Mexican heritage of the ability to claim their citizenship and return. And the final chapter of the book connects this history with some citizenship stripping of today. So I talk about the denaturalization campaign under the Trump administration, where to hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to establish a denaturalization office to investigate 700,000 naturalized citizens. Before President Trump, both Republicans and Democrats had rarely denaturalized people for 50 years. It had become something that most would not do. So about 11 people a year were denaturalized. The Trump administration wanted to denaturalize about 1,600 people a year. They fell far short, but that was the stated goal. Um, there was also uh, both in Obama and Trump's administration, the State Department would not grant passports to people born near the Southern border whose uh, birth certificates were signed by midwives. And many people are born outside of hospital settings in that area, there's not that many hospitals. There's also a mistaken detention and deportation of US citizens that happens at a really strikingly high rate um, and, and disturbingly high rate. And obviously the people of color more often than any other group. Um, and the final connection I make um, between the present day and the past is to the birther movement's claim that Barack Obama was not a natural born citizen. I thought at the time that this argument was made, and of course it was made by um, uh, the later President Trump, that this was laughable. And I think many people thought that. But I was really struck by the fact that in 2016, a New York Times poll showed, showed that more than half of Americans polled either thought he was not a citizen or questioned whether Barack Obama was a citizen. And when I connect that back to Hiram Rhodes Revels, that first African-American senator who wasn't seated in his seat for three days because it was claimed he was not a citizen, I think that history informs our understanding of the events today. So with that, I'll, I'll wind it up, but I'm really looking forward to Gary's comments and to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our discussant, uh, Gary Gerstel who is the Paul Mellon Professor of American History and a Fellow of Sydney Sussex College at Cambridge University. He's also a Fellow of the British Academy and of the Royal Historical Society. He is the author of more books, articles, and chapters than I could possibly recount, so I will only highlight a few. Working Class Americanism, The Politics of Labor in a Textile City, 1914 to 1960, published by Cambridge in 1989. American Crucible, Race and Nation in the 20th Century, Princeton University Press, 2001, a book that won the Immigration and Ethnic History Society's Salutis Prize back in 2001, and Liberty and Coercion, The Paradox of American Government from the Founding to the Present, 
Princeton University Press 2015, which also won the 2016 Hawley Prize. He's also the editor, uh, or rather co-editor, of a number of extremely influential collections, including the classic Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order, 1930 to 1980, published in 1989, Ruling America, A History of Wealth and Power in a Democracy, Harvard 2005, Beyond the New Deal Order, Pennsylvania, 2019, and most recently, States of Exception in American History, University of Chicago Press, 2020. And to list the articles, chapters, and fellowships might take the rest of the afternoon. So with that, uh, I will turn the Zoom room over to Gary Gerstel. Gary. You can hear me, I assume, yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thanks to the National History Center and the Wilson Center. And thanks to all of you for coming today. I can only see seven of you. That's that's life under the Zoom regime. Uh, but thank you for coming to talk about an important book and an important uh, topic. I want to thank Amanda Frost uh, for writing such, an, such a good and important work. It is learned, sweeping, and engagingly written. It is organized around 12 or 13 studies of naturalized Americans, depending how you count, <laughs> doesn't really matter, who had their citizenship stripped away or whom the government tried very hard to strip of their citizenship or th who through arduous struggle managed to establish a claim to citizenship where it had been denied. Their ranks, as you now know from Amanda's presentation include uh, some very well-known figures Dred Scott. Robert E. Lee is the surprise figure in this book, and I'll come back to him a little later. I'm glad he's in there. Emma Goldman, Harry Bridges, Wong Kim Ark. And then there are others uh, lesser known, but who are, are no less interesting and important for this story. Ethel Coop McKenzie, uh, Amanda, I don't know if you mentioned Ruth Bryan Owen, I didn't know uh, that uh, she was a Congresswoman uh, and William Jennings Bryan's uh, daughter who also had her citizenship stripped away when she married a foreigner. Fritz Julius Kuhn, America's chief resident Nazi of the 1930s. Joseph Kurihara, a, a Japanese American who, who had his citizenship stripped away in World War II. And, uh, and two uh, Mexican migrants who suffered greatly uh, as a result of the expulsions of the 1930s and after. Amanda takes us into their lives, their dreams, their aspirations, their hardships and sufferings. She makes them come alive. Amanda, you said this was one of your goals in writing the book as you did. It's the furthest thing one can imagine from a law review article. So my hearty, hearty congratulations. Uh, you've achieved that and it means that the stories of these individuals are accessible to a very big and broad literate public, and I'm glad they are. We come to understand through your writing the pain that the stripping of their citizenship caused them and their families and the damage it did to the American Republic. The publication of this book is part of what we one day may come to see as a turn in immigration studies. Once many moons ago, and here I'm going to give the crudest typology of immigration studies imaginable because Time is short, so forgive me, but I think it's useful. Many moons ago, the focus of immigration studies was on assimilation and Americanization or resistance to both. This project, not surprisingly, focused mostly on European immigrants. One thinks, for example, of Oscar Handlin, the uprooted, and 30 years later, John Bodner, the transplanted, or Herbert Gutman's once seminal essay, Work Culture and Society in Industrializing America, Eric knows that article as I do, but I suspect there's probably not more than eight other people in this audience of 200 today who know what I'm talking about. But it was once seminal and central to the field. Then the field shifted to a focus much more on the exclusion of groups from entering American society and the discrimination toward those in their ranks already here. This project focused much more on Asian and Latino immigrants who had been completely excluded from the first wave of immigration studies. One thinks here of May Nye's work, Impossible Subjects, or Erica Lee's Closing the Gates, and there's a host of other wonderful and important studies that really have changed 
the field of immigration history. But while Nye's and Lee's books brought questions of denaturalization and deportation into their stories, their quest, these questions were not at the center of their studies. Those questions are now becoming so. In Amanda's work and Francois Bay's book on denaturalization and the origins of the American Republic, and in Adam Goodman's recent book, The Deportation Machine, uh, published by Princeton University Press in 2020. And Amanda came out too late, I'm sure, for you to reckon with it in your book. But it's a sign that uh, of the interest in these subjects. More books and studies of this sort are coming. And this turn is not surprising given the Trump administration, the cruelest administration in terms of its policies toward immigrants in decades and maybe more. And this cruelty and its historical roots are things we have to reckon with both as historians and as citizens. And there are so many sources to be mined. I myself was once interested in studying deportation and denaturalization proceedings via the files on individual cases in what was once called the Immigration and Naturalization Service. This is now one of the great projects that I shall never do. But for those of you in the audience looking for good dissertations and book projects, especially those of you in the DC area know that the case files on these matters are out there waiting, waiting for their riches to be mined. Amanda's cases are mostly high profile cases, not all, but mostly. I'm thinking a study of denaturalization from the bottom up. Amanda's work will undoubtedly stir interest in this direction and we should thank her for that. There's a lot of work to be done. There are a lot of sources to be mined. There are a lot of stories to be told and reckoning to be done. To push discussion forward, I wanna raise a number of questions for Amanda, for her to answer and for us to discuss, and I'm sure there, there will be others. The first quest is a question of numbers. How many Americans over American history have in fact been stripped of their citizenship? And is that number large or small relative to the number of immigrants who have come to America and gained citizenship? Amanda's a little hazy on her, these numbers here, and I wanted her to address them. I'll, have, I'll say more about those in a moment. Uh, second, I'm going to ask Amanda to put her jurisprudential thinking cap on. I'm, I'm going to ask her to be a legal scholar and answer this question. What are the circumstances in which stripping someone of citizenship is justified in a liberal democratic society? Really interesting and not easy to answer question. And third, how are we to understand the arc of battles over citizenship across the last 150 years? When were efforts to, to denaturalize citizens most expansive, most insistent, and most successful? And when do they come up short? And what explains relative success and failure? Okay, a few words on each of these questions. Numbers, on page nine, Amanda, you claim that millions, I think, were denaturalized, but there are no citations here or later in the book about how that number was arrived at or how that number breaks down over time. I have difficulty understanding how the number could be that large unless we include in that number um, all Blacks who I guess you could say were denaturalized by the Dred Scott decision. Uh, then it would be a number in the millions, but I wanted you to address that. Um, then on page 151, you note that 22,000 were denaturalized by the end of the 20th century. And you add more than any other democracy before or since. And the footnote there is to Francois Bay. I don't, I'm in America now. I don't have Francois's book handy. It's on the other shore. So I, I couldn't check it. Um, but it, it also seems uh, too vague. Uh, from when to when are you, are you counting here? Also, one can make the argument that 22,000 over the course of American history is not a lot, given that America over that time took in 80 million immigrants, 22,000 versus 80 millions. Uh, now, the deportations of undocumented workers have been in the millions. That's without a doubt. But that's not the same as stripping people of the citizenship who already have it. So. I would like you to address the question of numbers because I think they're uh, important. Uh, my second question has to do with democratic theory and jurisprudence. Uh, who does the government have the right to, to strip citizenship of? Um, 
And here, this is the importance of in including Robert E. Lee in, in this story. I think we would say he stood accused in by, by he didn't actually go on trial, but he was more or less uh, convicted in the court of public opinion and in President Andrew Johnson's own mind of treason. Uh, it's not well known, I don't think, that Andrew Johnson never wanted that man to regain his citizenship in the American Republic. We don't have a lot of kind words to say about Andrew Johnson, but um, this is a stance uh, that he took and never gave up. We can say that people who take up arms against their own nation arguably could be stripped of their citizenship, engaging in acts of secession. And, and the fact that Lee is part of this book complicates the story in very interesting ways. We might, so if we identify uh, treason and secession as reason for denaturalization, we might add uh, major fraud in terms of presentation of oneself to immigration authorities. Here, I'm not talking about mod uh, modest fraud, inadvertent mistakes on lengthy forms impossible to decipher. Uh, think of um, a criminal trying to get into the United States under completely false pretenses to distribute drugs and other things and successfully applies for uh, naturalization. Uh, is, is the government justified in denaturalizing somebody like that? And then finally, what about ideology? And here, Amanda, you, you, your answer, I think, is no. And your two big examples are Emma Goldman and Harry Bridges, the first an anarchist and the second finally established, not just a labor leader, but a communist labor leader. Now, Amanda sides with William O. Douglas versus Sidney Hook in a famous debate they had in the early 50s. And the question they, that they debated was, was this, was being a member of an organization committed to revolution was that enough of a reason, simple membership, to indict someone or deport them for conspiring to overthrow the US government? To which Sidney Hook, a former Marxist who felt he knew the communist world really well, said yes. And to which William O. Douglas, the Supreme Court Justice, said absolutely not under any circumstances. One must have evidence of deeds for an actual conspiracy. I agree with Douglas, and I suspect Amanda does as well. But Amanda does not really tell us where she stands on Fritz Kuhn, head of the German American Bund, the equivalent of the American Nazi party in the 1930s and 40s, ardent in its support of Hitler, white supremacy, and the destruction of European Jewry. Or take an imag imaginary case, but one not hard to imagine. Construct for yourself the most virulent racist imaginable in 2021, one who wants to subjugate or purge all racial inferiors from America. That person immigrates to America. No one knows him or her to be the virulent ra racist that he or she really is. They are allowed to immigrate. They're allowed to naturalize. And then they become the most virulent racist in America. Nothing um, redeeming about their racism of the crudest sort and one that could lead to violence and death and perhaps the destruction of the principles underlying the American Republic. Is there ever a case for stripping someone like that of their citizenship? Again, not easy questions, but I, there's a complexity and, and, and a jurisprudence to this that I, I wanna bring to the surface. And I would, I would be really interested in, in Amanda's thoughts about these. Uh, finally, the third question about when uh, denaturalization is most successful and when it is less successful. The structure of Amanda's book has the effect of what we might say, um, uh, we, we might say it, it naturalizes denaturalization. Uh, this is something that Americans are pretty much doing in one form or another, continuously from the Civil War to the present. I don't know if Amanda believes that, it's more of a function of the structure of the book. Uh, 13 case studies marching across 150 years of American history. So at, at one level, this is certainly true. Uh, there are always moments and individuals who are being stripped of their citizenship. At a second level, it is also true. Those who are not who are non-white or were non-white or perceived as less than white, and here I might include Emma Goldman in that category in the early 20th century. These people across American history were more vulnerable to denaturalization proceedings than those who were seen as secure uh, 
in their whiteness. So uh, I do not dissent from that. But at a third level, denaturalization is not something that Americans were always doing or doing with the same intensity. Efforts to, to denaturalize, and I think this comes through in the book, I would argue, um, reached a peak in the first half of the 20th century, a period encompassed by mass immigration before it was cut off, the world historical Russian revolution, two world wars, and the beginning of the Cold War. All these developments made concerns about a population's loyalty paramount. And then denaturalization began to run into much stronger headwinds. The pivot are the four trials, or is it five trials of Harry Bridges? Think about this, four trials, five trials. They tried on five separate occasions to prove he was a communist and to strip him of his citizenship and deport him to Australia. Now, on the one hand, we might consider five trials inhuman, inhumane, both to put one person through certainly qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment, but then Bridges wins and he wins the right to stay in the United States. And he wins in a decade when the Supreme Court became much more concerned about the erosion of civil liberties in which American society began to scrutinize racist practices in immigration and naturalization that it had rarely examined before. And in which America began to articulate Gener generous refugee asylum policies for the first time, a belated response to the shame of the country's indifference to the slaughter of European Jewry in the 1930s and 40s. Amanda acknowledges this shift, but it but does not dwell on it. And yet the shift I think ought to be dwelled on. There was a regime of uh, increasing the sanctity of American citizenship and of shrinking the space in which one's citizenship could be challenged that began, I would argue, in the 1950s and carried on through the 1980s. And that since the 1980s, we have begun to see a shift back to a harder borders regime, more efforts at denaturalization, beginning with Clinton, continuing with Obama and culminating in Trump. So part of my point here is that you can't understand this strictly by looking at who's sitting in the White House or who's controlling Congress. There are deeper forces at work here. Questions of demography, and questions of demography, politics and culture are all involved. And a full understanding of America's disposition towards citizenship stripping requires that we attend to these questions. Attending to these questions matters not just for the past, but for the present, because it has a relevance not simply to how we understand the world we live, but how we can begin to act on it. And if in fact we do identify the 1950s and 60s and 70s as, as a time when America began to reckon with its past misdeeds in terms of its immigration and citizenship regime, then we might learn something about how we might construct a similar or even better regime for the future. Amanda's book has opened up this vast and rich and complex tableau for us and we are in her debt. Thank you very much, Amanda, for giving me the opportunity to read and think upon your book. Thank you very much, Gary. Amanda, there are a number of questions uh, that uh, have been posed if you would like to respond. Uh, this is your moment. Great. Thank you. And uh, Gary, thank you for doing me the really great honor of engaging with the book um, for the kind words, but also for the really terrific and searching and probing questions you just asked. Um, that's, uh, to me, the, the sign of the greatest respect to, to an author to have someone read the book so closely and have those sorts of questions. So I'll do my best to answer them. And you're absolutely right about a little haziness about the numbers, but I will clarify a couple of things. First is just to clarify the distinction between denaturalization and citizenship stripping. So I use the term citizenship stripping as all encompassing. Every type of loss of citizenship is citizenship stripping. And that's pretty much how it's used. I won't say that's a technical legal term. Denaturalization is a technical legal term and there are statutes that permit denaturalization. And it's when I said 22,000 people were denaturalized and I was quoting there Patrick Vale, who's a, 
a French uh, academic who wrote a great book called Sovereign Citizen about denaturalization specifically, not citizenship stripping generally, but denaturalization, which is one chapter of my book and one smaller component of a phenomenon that goes far beyond. So Ethel McKenzie, who was born in the United States, a US citizen by virtue of the fact she was born on US soil, when she lost her citizenship, that wasn't denaturalization. She wasn't a naturalized citizen. That was citizenship stripping, sometimes called denationalization. Um, and the same for um, the, the, uh, the, some of the other stories that I follow through the book, um, including, for example, Wong Kim Ark, born in the United States, but the, United, the US government said, we don't care, we still don't think you're a citizen. They weren't denaturalizing him, they were denying his citizenship. So that's the distinction between the numbers. There were 22,000 people denaturalized. And I said, as you noted, a little, a little fuzzy, millions who lost their citizenship, including denaturalized citizens. So how did I get to that number? So um, I will explain how I thought it was millions and also why I didn't try to be more precise. So first it was the entire African-American population of the, 19, of the United States in 1857, which was 4.5 million people. Um, and there was, although I would say the slaves were, their citizenship was very questionable. Free blacks had been treated as citizens in many states. So Dred Scott was citizenship stripping. Um, I think by my definition, really without question. And it's, it, the decision was criticized on those grounds at the time. Um, you, you take in citizenship and the rights of citizenship from this enormous group of people with a stroke of a pen. Um, so the same to, uh, of the women who married non-citizens. And that number is also unclear, but it appears to be in the tens of thousands. So not huge, but not tiny either. Um, then we have the Mexican-Americans who lost their citizenship through mass repatriations. So num people vary in their count of how many people lost their citizenship as a result of the forced removals from the United States to Mexico in the 1930s and again in the 1950s. But the numbers are somewhere between a million and a million point five from those two instances combined. Now, not all of those were US citizens. Some of those were Mexican immigrants with US citizen children. Um, so the estimates are about 60% of that group were Mexican Americans. And you might say, well, were they really stripped of their citizenship? And I agree that could be debated. The reason I call that citizenship stripping is that I found documents from the time and a California state Senate hearing was really a terrific uh, resource in, in this regard where it was very clear that the government officials knew that by deporting these families and by doing so in a way that ensured they couldn't take documentation with them, it was often sometimes at gunpoint, sometimes overnight, sometimes under very coercive tactics, they were deporting them in ways that they knew they couldn't come back. And that was the goal, especially during the depression, but also in the 1950s. So I call that citizenship stripping. I suppose we could debate that. And some of those people did manage to come back because they got relatives to search out their birth certificates and come back to the United States. And those are some of the stories that I tell. So of course you include the Japanese Americans who were coerced into renouncing their citizenship. Now they did renounce it, but under the condition of being in a prison camp um, with great threat to their life and liberty and their ability of their family to stay together. So I call that citizenship stripping and that's another 6,000 people. Um, uh, again, all of the people that, if the Solicitor General of the United States had been successful in his argument in Wong Kim Ark, every child of uh, immigrants who had not naturalized would have overnight not been citizens. And in fact, they postponed the argument in the Wong Kim Ark case until after the presidential election, because both sides recognized that an issue in this case was whether hundreds of thousands of people, maybe more, could vote, right? Because if they weren't citizens, they couldn't vote. So I think those numbers easily add up to millions. Now, how many millions, I agree, I'm, I'm not counting. And frankly, the counting didn't seem too important to me. Although I take your point, like it would have been nice to have had a little more detail on that number. And so in retrospect, maybe I should have, but that's how I got there. And I do think it's clearly millions, at least with my definition. So um, that's one point to make. Your second question, I love your second question. Your second question is who, if anyone deserves to lose their citizenship? And I have thought about this a lot. So. Robert E. Lee is, I think he is the surprise. It's why I have him right there in the intro. Um, this idea of, oh, Lee wasn't a citizen. And then, you know, at one point he was vilified. He was indicted for treason. He must have really legitimately feared for his life. He begged for a pardon he did not get and was never gonna get. And he died without some of those citizenship rights. And then of course he was posthumously granted a citizenship back in 1975, which I thought was another great symbolic detail. 
So my view on Robert E. Lee is we should always call him a U.S. citizen. He was never not a U.S. citizen, even when he fought and killed people under the claim of not wanting to be a U.S. citizen because he wanted to form a, a nation built on slavery. And I think we need to own him as a U.S. citizen because he is us and we can't pretend he's not. And that's part of facing history. And my view is, you know, like it or not, Robert E. Lee is a fellow American citizen, as is Jefferson Davis. Um, so that's my view on, on Lee and Davis and other Confederate leaders. The, the person who comes closest to representing the group that I think could lose their citizenship, and I'm speaking really as a lawyer here, the denaturalization statutes do provide grounds for, for stripping, for denaturalizing people, um, one form of citizenship stripping. And I think they're way too broadly worded and there's no statute of limitations. But that said, I do think we need to have some method of denaturalizing people because otherwise fraud could be used. You know, imagine a Nazi you know, prison guard, and you don't have to imagine there were some, who lied about their past, came to the United States, were hiding from their crimes. And then it turns out that in fact, they lied and they were Nazi war criminals. Do they deserve to lose their citizenship? You know, yes. Um, and Fritz Julius Kuhn, is perhaps an example of this. He hadn't been a US citizen for that long. He was naturalized. He had lied on his application about some uh, criminal history. He was, as you say, a leader of the German American Bund. He said he called himself a German in America. He didn't say he was a German American. And he thought, I mean, he's sort of perfect for my book because his view of citizenship is citizenship is by blood and all Germans were of German ethnicity, whatever that means, you know, wherever they are in the world. They are together German citizens. And he didn't give much weight, he said, to his US citizenship. That said, the detail I love about him is after he lost his citizenship and he was denaturalized and deported because of crimes he committed, as well as because of his membership in the Bund during a time when we were at war with Germany. After he lost his citizenship and he was deported, after he made all these statements about how his German blood was thicker than his you know, US citizenship, he's sitting in a German prison and he writes to the US government wanting his American citizenship back, which you know, I, I think is such a, an interesting example of where he came out at the end of the day. But he's probably the one person in the book where I'd say, I think I'm comfortable with the idea that he deserved to lose his citizenship. Although, frankly, his views about blood and viewing uh, race as more important than, than citizenship papers was shared by many Americans at the time he held them. Um, but that said, I do think he's somebody who probably is the weakest claim to retain his citizenship. So your last question about, um, you know, what would be, what would make it, a, you know, when was denaturalization or citizenship stripping successful? Did it go into this period of decline or this lull that you described that sort of post-Cold War to the 1980s? What does this say about us as a nation and our history? And when was denaturalization or citizenship stripping both? Um, uh, you know, at its sort of height or heyday and what conditions led to that. Well, your point about demography is really interesting because of course we see citizenship stripping resurging as we see deportations surging as the percentage of foreign born in the United States grows. And in fact, today it's close to 15% of the population, which is the same as it was in the early part of the 20th century when we saw the rise of xenophobia and anti-immigration laws. So there clearly is some connection or, or maybe potentially some connection, I should say, between that demography and the, the resulting reaction, right? Um, so I see that and I agree with you that it's across many administrations, not simply President Trump, although his was the most overt and they were very clear about it. They wanted to denaturalize people. It was a clear plan. They funded it with hundreds of millions of dollars. It was a goal and it was part of the immigration enforcement. So. Um, they were perhaps clearer about it and more articulate than other administrations, but I would agree it was not limited to that administration. So yes, demography was part of the rise of citizenship stripping, it was part of the rise of xenophobia and anti-immigration sentiment in the first half of the 20th century, world wars, fear of the outsider. As I was researching Harry Bridges, I was struck by newspaper headlines from reputable papers saying that communists were going to take over San Francisco if Harry Bridges wasn't stopped. And there was real genuine fear of, you know, this was not like in, in theory, this was there are people hiding in our city with guns and knives that are about to, you know, kill our government and take over. And, you know, I have to believe that some of that fear was, it, it wasn't based on anything rational, I don't think, but it was 
a real fear, and that was motivating this. So fear, right? Stoking fear, the rise of fear, the fear of the outsider and the other is very much a part of the story. But I will push back at one uh, piece of the way you describe it, which is you talk about a lull from the sort of, I would say 1960s, 70s, 80s. It may be there, the lull, but the lull you're talking about, I think is a lull in the law, in legal action, in formal attempts to strip citizenship. My book, by the end, I'm very engaged in this sort of extra legal citizenship stripping. So the government might say, yeah, if you're born in the US, you're a citizen, but we're gonna make it really hard to prove you were born in the United States, which is true for some groups right now, like people born outside of hospital settings. And I've talked to many um, who have trouble proving to the government they're citizens, because how do they prove it? They've got a birth certificate, but it's signed by a midwife and the government won't accept it. And they have no memories of that day. <laughs> so it's a little hard to prove. Um, and also mistaken detentions and deportations. I think, you know, there's a great a scholar at Northwestern who's just exploring those issues. And she estimates about 1% of the population in ICE at any time are US citizens. And these are folks who you know, occasionally they reach the pages of the New Yorker. There was a great New Yorker piece about it. But most of this goes unrecognized and unknown. So I think formal legal stripping, citizenship stripping as a matter of law declined, but I'm not sure how much it declined as a matter of immigration and customs and border patrol officials deciding whether or not you're an American and you present yourself at the border or when you're near a border area or when you just don't look like an American, which still happens today. So, but thank you again for engaging in the book so thoughtfully and I hope that answered some of your questions and I look forward to other questions from the audience, I hope. Thank you very, very much. We're now going to open up the question and discussion uh, section. Uh, you've got, as Christian pointed out uh, at the beginning, a number of ways to pose a question. Uh, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. That way we call on you uh, and we can actually hear your voice. Um, you can use the question and answer function uh, on Zoom in which you post a question and I get to read it, um, or you can send an email to Rachel Wheatley, uh, whose address is in the chat um, uh, if you're watching um, from Facebook Live. Uh, and so I've got a number of hands up and a number of questions in the Q&A and uh, the distinguished historian, Robert Cherney, who populates some of your footnotes uh, in the Harry Bridges chapter, uh, has a hand up. Uh, so I will ask uh, Bob to unmute himself uh, and to join the conversation and to pose a question. Thanks. Um, and it's nice to actually see Amanda. We communicated by email for quite a while. Uh, and I may have raised this question with you at the time, but, but it's not one that appears in your book because I'm not sure it's directly relevant. So I'm throwing it out there more generally. In my research on Harry Bridges, one of the things I discovered was that Australia would not have been willing to accept him if he had been deported. And therefore, and the federal government knew this. And, and therefore their continuing efforts would have simply placed him in what was called custodial detention. As of the 1940s, there were apparently several thousand people in that situation in the US. And I'm wondering if anyone has really looked at those programs, you know, were they actually in prison? Were they kind of on parole? I found another example of such a person uh, who was supposed to be deported to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would not accept him. And he was in what seemed to be a kind of parole status uh, until the 1950s when he was finally accepted and sent back to the Soviet Union. So my question is, um, what does anyone know about all of those people who were scheduled to be who were denaturalized, scheduled to be deported, and were not accepted. Great. Well, first, thank you. <laughs> a big thank you, Bob, for all the help that you gave, and you're very uh, extraordinarily generous in his response to my questions and looking at my chapter on Harry Bridges. So a big thank you. Um, as to your question, yes, I was fascinated by that aspect of the Bridges story because not only did he face prison time because it was claimed that he lied to get a, a citizenship he, he, and he would have faced some prison time if he'd been convicted. But he also would not have been able to be deported to Australia, it appeared, as you say, because Australia wouldn't take him back. So then what would happen, you ask? Well, there's case law on this. In fact, I just taught it last week uh, to my immigration class. There's a case called, um, uh, well, there's a man called Ignaz Meze, 
who uh, brought suit because he was held on Ellis Island for four years because no country would take him. And it was during the Cold War era when you know, European borders shifted on you know, a daily basis for a while. No one quite knew what country he could be claimed to be from. He'd been 20 years in the United States, had or more, it wasn't quite clear, but decades. He'd gone to Europe. When he came back, the government said, we don't uh, want to admit you. And the question is where to put you. And they kept him in detention for four years, as I've said. And the Supreme Court said, that's fine. We're, we're allowing that indefinite detention for someone for whom no country will take them. And at the time, um, uh, you know, that occurred, as you say, thousands of others were in detention. And even in the modern era, there was a case more recently called Zedvitas versus United States before the Supreme Court uh, in 2001, where an individual was being held indefinitely because no country would take him. The Supreme Court then said, you can't do that. You can't deport him. You have to release him into the United States. And there was 3,000 others in his position. So I think Bridges would have spent many years in detention somewhere as a non-citizen with nowhere to go. But that's an excellent and interesting question. And Bridges came awfully close to that fate. The Supreme Court saved him by a couple of votes, as, as you well know. Thank you. Sarah Rodriguez has a hand up if uh, you would unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to hear more about your book, um, particularly uh, uh, this idea of um, citizenship, what it means, what rights and responsibilities one gets and what one can lose uh, through the loss of citizenship has really been uh, sitting on my mind with my research in particular. And I was wondering um, if you found anything in your research or had any kind of thoughts on um, the connection between cultural norms and dominant ideas of morality um, and the process or history of citizenship stripping. Um, one of the examples I can think of is, uh, which Jennifer Plyley talks about in her book, Policing Sexuality, is the um, development of the early history of the FBI around um, policing state borders uh, for human trafficking issues through the Mann Act. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, those kind of uh, connections in terms of citizenship stripping. Yes, I will say that there is a component to citizenship stripping in many of the cases I looked at um, and many of the groups targeted, that basically the view is you're not worthy of being an American, right? And to some degree, that was the argument that was being made. So it was certainly made about Chinese Americans. The argument that uh, those born in China, uh, sorry, those born in the United States of Chinese immigrant parents, the argument was they can't be citizens. And the reason is at that point in time, the United States had barred ch new Chinese immigrants from coming under the Chinese Exclusion Act and barred uh, these Chinese immigrants in the US from naturalizing. And that bar remained in place until 1943. And the arguments members of Congress made is this is a group of people who cannot assimilate, we see that word, and also cannot be entrusted uh, with democracy, can't be entrusted with the right to vote. They, they don't understand democracy and can't practice democracy. So there was definitely these cultural norms and values imposed upon them by the uh, United States government saying, these are not people worthy of being US citizens. And I will say also that uh, Chinese women immigrants in particular were often accused of being prostitutes and barred for that reason. There were individual laws, uh, more specific laws barring uh, women coming to the United States uh, as prostitutes. And oftentimes this was just this view of the United, the United States has of these women that was not necessarily uh, supported by fact, but they were viewed as immoral, um, and viewed as a destructive force in the US, you know, our US democratic culture. So that was definitely a theme to stripping citizenship uh, from Chinese Americans. It was the idea that we can't give them citizenship because that would be a loophole to all these laws and rules that we put in place to try to bar this group of people from coming because they're not worthy of being Americans. Um, and in fact, there was even a comment about we couldn't possibly have one of them as, as president, but then they'd be a natural born citizen and would be allowed. Um, and you see that theme again and again. So again, maybe the other place we could point it out would be the politically motivated denaturalizations, which is one chapter of the book. And so someone like Emma Goldman was targeted for what she said for her speech, her ideas. Um, she was viewed as 
both a dangerous force and you know, she was an anarchist. So there was some truth to the fact that her words could sometimes inspire uh, deeds. And because she was um, you know, viewed as uh, an outsider to what the US culture expected of someone in her position. You know, she was supposed to be uh, docile and quiet and she was anything but. And the same goes for US citizen women who married uh, non-citizens. The congressional hearings on this are, I mean, they're almost funny. Uh, it, these, these congressmen, and this was before women got the right to vote in the 19th Amendment. So they're having hearings on uh, the expatriation law that took away citizenship from US citizen women who married non-citizens. And they said, well, why don't you marry you know, the good old American boys? Why do you have to go find these foreign men and pollute our nation with the children of these foreign men? That's why you're, we're taking your citizenship. So you, know, you see a connection there between the views of you know, what made for a good citizen and whether or not someone could keep it their, their citizenship. Um, and you know, of course, and this was Gary's terrific question that I'm not sure I did address in my comments earlier about, well, to what degree can your membership in the Communist Party or your political views ever be a basis for citizenship stripping? And I think, you know, of course, he, he read me correctly. I'm with Justice Douglas. I mean, if someone commits a crime, by all means, we have lots and lots and lots of criminal laws in the United States, uh, you know, pursue them criminally. But if they haven't done something that's a crime, why use citizenship or denaturalization as a basis to expel them or take away their rights? That I think is not, should not be permitted by law. Thank you. David Sobelson has a hand up. Um, if you would unmute uh, and pose your question for us. Thank you. This has been very, very interesting. Um, just as slavery has badges and incidents, so does citizenship. Voting is the classic example. And nowadays, some local jurisdictions are actually letting non-citizens vote in local elections. Does citizenship have gradations or is it either or? And to what extent does citizenship's importance depend on the importance of the nation state as the core to legal identity? Wow, that's, that's a big question and a very important one. And in some ways, my book is sort of awfully conservative because I assume the citizenship label should carry the weight that it does. So I'll first say, I think it does carry that weight. There's some debate today about, well, there's so many dual citizens. Is citizenship really important? Yes, it is, I argue. It, first of all, the right to enter and remain in the United States is extremely important. And of course, the right to vote, which today perfectly tracks citizenship almost with the exception of, of course, children and in some states felons. What's interesting is in the past, citizenship didn't perfectly track uh, voting. In fact, non-citizens could vote. My uh, former colleague and now US Congressman Jamie Raskin wrote a terrific article about this. He's a brilliant legal scholar as well as a great member of Congress. And he wrote about this because it used to be, it, there used to be, I think, more blurry edges to legal rights and privileges that we now think of as, as aligned with citizenship. So in the colonial era and then in the early American um, decades in which we were a new country, getting right up until sort of the 1850s, non-citizens could vote and serve on juries and citizens couldn't, right? Of course, all women couldn't vote um, and they were viewed as citizens. And uh, those who didn't own property or who weren't wealthy or who weren't white often couldn't vote. So it's interesting that we've created a category now, citizen, where we put all those political and civil rights and the non-citizen has far fewer. So we've created those two categories. They weren't always such clear binaries. There were more gradations in the past than today. But that's where my book explains that I think citizenship scripting became a useful proxy for taking away rights that had once been denied to people based on gender, color of their skin, ethnicity, political opinion, wealth. It used to be possible to bar the vote to those people. Then it became all citizens can do this except maybe we're gonna take away citizens from certain disfavored groups. And that's one argument in my book. Thank you. From the Q&A function, we have a question uh, posed early on from Stephen Shore, uh, who asks, and I know you address this in the book, were, you, were male citizens who married non-citizens also subject to loss of citizenship? And he has a follow-up on a completely different subject. Uh, did Fritz Kuhn ever actually call for the destruction of European Jewry? Okay, so um, the, what happened to men who married non-citizens is their wives automatically became citizens. And Congress explained this because it said, US citizen men will guide and educate their wives. 
in uh, the ways of the United States. And so the wives deserve to have immediate citizenship. So that was a fascinating juxtaposition. And I see the laws taking away the citizenship of uh, US citizen women who married non-citizens as being a combination of you know, both sexist beliefs, the belief of in coverture, the idea that there was one legal identity for a family and it was the husband's. And in fact, there was one passport for the family at that point in time. And it would be the husband's passport with the family members on it. So it was the idea that you could only have one legal identity that in part led to the rule saying that the, de- the citizenship of the man controlled the citizenship of the family. But of course it was also xenophobia. It was also fear of you know, the, the pollution of the United States by the children of non-citizens. So those two things together, I think really motivated the um, expatriation law of 1907. And then the way that law slowly got removed from the books is also fascinating because I think it was in 1922, uh, the law was radically altered to end citizen strip, stripping for most women who married non-citizens, but not for women who married men who weren't eligible to naturalize. And that was everybody who wasn't either white or black. So if you married an Arab, if you married a man from China, you would lose your citizenship. And it was fascinating the way in which the US kept race a part of this. And I will also say to our shame that Nazi lawyers cited US citizenship laws as models for the Nuremberg laws, because we were doing this before Nazi Germany existed. And it took us until the 1950s to get rid of these racial categories in citizenship. Um, Your question about Fritz Kuhn, I won't claim to be, I mean, I've read a lot about Fritz Kuhn. I don't know that I know every word he ever said. He was so clearly anti-Semitic, but did he call for you know, the death of the European Jewry? I don't know that he ever said that out loud. What I did find utterly fascinating is that he's at a hearing before um, the House on American Activities Committee and Joe Starnes, the representative from Alabama is giving him a really hard time. Now Starnes was a virulent racist, NAACP had a book this thick on him and all the things he was doing to his African-American constituents, sort of um, people who lived in the state. Um, so he was a very open racist and he starts questioning Kuhn, who he decides he doesn't like. And he says to Kuhn, aren't you anti-Semitic? And Kuhn said he was many times. And Kuhn said, yes, I am. Aren't you? And it was such a moment for me because I thought Representative Starnes acts like he's like some man free of racial bias. <laughs> um, and, you know, he isn't. So Fritz Kuhn was openly anti-Semitic. I don't know about calling for the destruction of the European Jewry. I think he probably never said that out loud. And that's my guess. Thank you. John Martin, your hand is up. Unmute yourself and ask a question. And if you could identify yourself uh, as well. Uh, I'm a retired uh, network television news correspondent and a research fellow at the Wilson Center. And recently I began looking at myself and realizing I'm the grandson of four immigrants three of Irish descent and one a Dane. A Dane came illegally. They all came around the end of the 19th century. Was there ever, your book sounds wonderful, and I'm looking forward to reading it, but was there ever a time when the Irish were targeted for citizenship stripping? Uh, First of all, I think that means you could get Irish citizenship, or at least in the past you could, um, uh, because Ireland gives out citizenship on that basis or did. Uh, so I, don't, I am not aware of any targeting of the I, Irish in particular for citizenship stripping or those of Irish descent for citizenship stripping. Now, to the degree that there were naturalized citizens who then um, you know, engaged in political conduct, but I would say that the government didn't like, but I would say that's more about political opinion than their um, roles as Irish Americans. There is a fascinating um, history and uh, Lucy Sawyer, a terrific author, has written it under the starry flag, I think it's called, about Irish Americans who went to fight for Irish independence. And this was in the early 1800s. And it's part of what precipitated the War of 1812 because the Ireland wanted to try them as, uh, the British wanted to try them as traitors. And they said, no, we can't be traitors, we're Americans. And the British said, you can't be Americans, you're Irish. And there was a really fascinating back and forth about whether or not the US could claim these people as citizens. Um, But that is not citizenship stripping. In fact, that's sort of the opposite, the US claiming them. So I'm not aware of any targeting of Irish Americans for citizenship stripping, although there certainly was bigotry and discrimination against that group, as I'm guessing you know. 
Benjamin Tua's hands up. If you would unmute and identify yourself, you can pose a question. Benjamin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. My question is uh, concerning the position of the eminent scholar Samuel Huntington, who argued that uh, Latin Americans uh, were unsuitable to be US citizens. Well, so, uh, I mean, I'm familiar with Samuel Huntington. I don't know his exact position on that question, but to some degree, that statement, if it was made, fits well with the points I was making in the book on this, which is a sense of who belongs. So I see the 14th Amendment as the key here because it was a moment when the Reconstruction Congress was hoping to transform a nation that had always been divided by, of course, slavery, which had been embraced in the Constitution, um, had been divided over these questions of what was the United States going to be. And men like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens said, we are going to be a nation in which all that matters is you're born here. You have all the rights and privileges of anyone else, regardless of your race, uh, your background, your parents, et cetera. And as uh, Charles Sumner said, he wanted the 14th Amendment to get rid of caste and oligarchy of skin. That's the way he put it. He thought he was putting an end to that. So statements about who could and couldn't be a good American citizen to me are uh, at you know, anomalous in light of the constitution we have and the values we have as a nation. And when they, the, when Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner and the rest of the Reconstruction Congress said, we want a 14th amendment that is, creates an egalitarian society, free of caste, free of oligarchy of skin. What they said is we think that's the value embodied in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. We've never lived up to it, it's time we started. They started us on that project in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified. And you know we're still working on it, but um, I think a statement like that by Stanley Huntington takes us back to before that amendment was added and is inconsistent with the values of uh, our constitution today. If I remember that book by Huntington, it came out around 2004 and it's called, Who Are We? Um, and it's very much a book in the nativist tradition. Uh, you know, America as kind of a white Protestant, you know, Western European culture, um, uh, and uh, it was just suffused with um, uh, nativist sentiment, uh, particularly directed against uh, Mexican immigrants, uh, if, if I recall that uh, correctly. We have a question from Uzma Qurashi, who asks, could you discuss the place of Native Americans in this history of citizenship stripping as they represent or present a unique case unlike any other group that migrated after the founding of the United States? So uh, a great question and one that shows the, the author of the question understands this issue because um, every group that I describe as being their citizenship being challenged or being stripped, that was a way of disempowering them, of taking away their political and civil rights, and as treating them as other in a way that diminished their status. Native Americans are different. And I do mention this in the book and address it briefly, but I, I think you need a whole book on Native American citizenship. Um, and some people have written them, but um, my book addresses it briefly because Native American citizenship was complicated in that at the time the 14th Amendment was enacted, granting birthright citizenship to everyone born in the United States who was within the jurisdiction of the United States. And that term was added to exclude those born to, uh, uh, on Native American reservations, those born to Native American parents on reservations. But the exclusion was not to diminish the rights of that group. The exclusion was intended to protect that group because they were a sovereign nation within the United States. And to grant them automatic US citizenship was seen as disrespectful and also undermining their status as a sovereign nation. Another group that was excluded and still is today is the, the children of diplomats. So if the French ambassador to the US has a child in the US, that child is not automatically a US citizen. And that makes perfect sense, right? We wouldn't want that to happen. And it was the same sort of respectful nod at a sovereign nation that led the framers of the 14th amendment to exclude Native Americans. Now, we've moved from that position for many reasons. And in fact, in 1924, Congress enacted the Indian Citizenship Act. So 
Native Americans are citizens at birth, just like everybody else, but it's through statute, not by the constitution. And again, as, as I think the questioner realized, it's because of the unique status of Native American tribes within the United States that they were excluded from that amendment. Thank you. Thomas Timberg uh, poses a question. What about concern with statelessness on, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And can a non-citizen commit treason? Yes, yeah, so statelessness is interesting because actually a few European countries, and this was a question in the Q&A as well, a few European countries has, have revived citizenship stripping in their statutes, on their, on their statute books. But they say, well, we can't do it to someone who would be sta stateless as a result because statelessness is a unique human rights problem. Uh, uh, one that we saw, of course, uh, the world witness post-World War II and as often citizenship is sort of the gateway to all other rights. So to be stateless is to lose access to all of those other rights, not to mention a place to call home, a place where you have a right to remain. So statelessness is um, a, a, you know, a terrifically important concern when we think about citizenship stripping. And countries that are now overtly engaged in citizenship stripping, like Great Britain, um, which has a statute on its books that allows for it and has done that, limits citizenship stripping to those who have another citizenship. So they can, in fact, uh, not lose a place to call home, essentially. And I'm sorry, I think I lost the second part of the question, Eric. Was there another aspect of that question? Sorry about the unmute. Can non-citizens commit treason? Yes, excellent question. So, you know, that goes to the, the formality of law of treason. I, I would say no, which is, makes it particularly interesting that Robert E. Lee was indicted for treason, as was Jefferson Davis. And there was, Davis was really at risk of a trial that could have resulted in an execution. Um, but uh, Lee less so, I think. But um, the question is, you know, could you, could you have both at once? Could they be US citizens indicted for treason and also non-citizens, which is how Congress sometimes refer to them. And there's like the, the, there was a clear understanding that the US government union at that time was sort of walking both lines throughout the war. They sort of referred to the South as criminals at times, US citizens, but criminals, and at other times as an enemy nation. And it was whatever label served them best. But I would say typically treason has to be by a citizen who owes loyalty to their country, not by a non-citizen. Thank you. Kevin Kenny, an immigration historian, uh, poses a question. Uh, in Wong Kim Ark, Chief Justice Fuller defended Jus Sanguinis uh, over Jus Soli, arguing somewhat deviously that automatic citizenship by birthright violated the principle of consent at the heart of American citizenship. The government also argued that in a world dominated by Jus Sanguinis, granting Birthright citizenship in the US would lead to dual allegiance. Are versions of these arguments alive today? And if so, what's the best response to them? Yes, so there, the versions are alive, both in academic discourse. There's um, a, a, a book, famous book, uh, Citizenship by Consent, which is published now a number of years ago that made some similar arguments. And of course, we saw in the last four years, a lot of discussion about whether the children of undocumented immigrants born in the United States should get birthright citizenship. And President Trump said on several occasions that he thought he unilaterally could take away citizenship from the children of undocumented immigrants who were born in the United States. And what was fascinating to me about that discussion is he cited, um, he, or rather he made the same arguments that Holmes Conrad, the Solicitor General in 1897 made before the Supreme Court. He made the same argument, which is he said, the children of undocumented immigrants don't owe allegiance to the United States and so aren't subject to the jurisdiction of the United States and so are excluded from that 14th Amendment birthright citizenship guarantee. So that was one argument. And the citizenship by consent argument, I would say sort of, I don't know that Trump understood the legal argument, but lurks behind some of what he said, but it's always confused me because you know, I was born to parents who were citizens, not immigrants, and I was born in the United States. I don't remember consenting at any point to my citizenship. Um, so I'm not quite understanding what the distinction is between the children of undocumented immigrants or the children of immigrants, such that there's consent by one group and not by the other. 
I do think the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the principles that our nation was founded on, which is you consent to be governed and you consent to your government, mean that we must have a right to leave the United States and its citizenship if we want to. And in fact, there is such a law. You can expatriate yourself. You have to make it clear and go through some procedural hurdles. But if you want to stop being a U.S. citizen, you have the right to do it. So there is a, a provision in the law that allows exit by those who don't consent to being citizens any longer. But that's very different from saying we're going to deny citizenship to all born. And I think especially considering the history of our nation, birthright citizenship is essential to the values of our country. Thank you. Omar de Jesus asks, do you refer to any precedent from other countries in citizen strip, si si stripping citizenship? So um, I, in the book, I, I refer briefly in, in the introduction and maybe a few other places, but it's not, a, I, don't, I don't do a comparative study. But I will say that I am fascinated. I've been in France for the last uh, two years and I've been studying citizenship and citizenship stripping in France and England and some other European countries. And there are comparisons. So for example, France and Britain, maybe other countries as well, said that women who married non-citizens automatically lost their citizenship around the same time the United States did. What's fascinating to me is that some of these countries are giving citizenship back to either the actual spouses or more likely the children who didn't get citizenship because their mothers had been deprived of citizenship stripping under sexist laws. So I have a friend whose mother is German and she didn't inherit German citizenship because her mother was barred from um, passing it along to her daughter by marrying a non-citizen. And she's applied for German citizenship now under these rules. Of course, Spain and Portugal famously uh, expelled Sephardic Jews 500 years ago, and they've said, you can apply for our citizenship and get it back. So citizenship as restitution for Pax Strong seems to be a, a new uh, a thing in Europe. I mean, Germany, of course, has done it as well with the Jewish population. So it's a really fascinating development. And I talk a little bit about this in the book, but not in great detail, but I may write a book on this. <laughs> so stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, and another question um, uh, from the, the same questioner. Uh, do you also refer to the insular cases about whether inhabitants of the territories that were annexed after the Spanish-American War, uh, Filipinos or Puerto Ricans, could be considered citizens? And would you consider this a case of denaturalization or citizenship stripping? You know, I, briefly, and I didn't get its own chapter. I can I say here, my publisher, who you know, I love, but there was a word limit, and I over I exceeded it by. It's a, not a long book. It's it's a, a hundred thousand words, which for a, a, a book of history is not terribly long, but it's fifteen thousand words over what the publisher wanted. So the answer is, I didn't address the insular cases in detail. They are cited and discussed in places, and they deserve more treatment. So again, as I said, maybe another book. There's plenty to write about here, and. When we think about the actual number, if we just define citizenship stripping broadly, I think it's a really shockingly high number of people whose citizenship was questioned, even to this day, where residents of, I think it's Northern Mariana Islands are nationals of the United States, but not citizens, and they filed court cases, but lost. They have yet to get full citizenship status. Thank you very much. I'm afraid it's that time of day where I unfortunately have to bring this to a close, uh, but I do want to thank everyone uh, who has been watching and participating with your questions. My apologies to those of you who we could not get to. Uh, and of course, my thanks to Amanda Frost and to Gary Gerstel for what I think is just a terrific conversation this afternoon. My appreciation. And with that, I turn this back to Christian Osterman, who will wrap things up. Christian. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let me just remind everyone that our next session will be uh, take place uh, this coming Monday, April 12th, when we'll discuss Ron Suni's new Stalin biography. Thanks to Amanda, Gary, and Eric for, as I have to agree with Eric, just a phenomenal discussion, one of the best we've had here in the Washington History Seminar. Thanks to all of you for your question and for watching. We're adjourned. Stay safe. Good night.